Thank you. To all of you, I got off the plane and I realized I was in a special place and have come to find out that you are the city of neighborhoods and it feels that way because it's extraordinarily friendly and it's been a wonderful visit um, with your students, your faculty, and it's a great honor to deliver this lecture. Um, the, the reason for it, uh, Glenn Gresham has had such a huge impact in getting rehabilitation started and even more proximal to that was Dr. Notak and the work that was done that made it possible for rehab to begin here in Buffalo, but it was a national movement. So thank you. Today I'm going to um, share a story through data and take you on um, a journey to give you a perspective that we've developed about stroke and putting the pieces together. But I have to tell you, it was initiated nearly 20 years ago when the James S. McDonald Foundation, Mr. James S. McDonald was the McDonald Aircraft, and he had a stroke, and his life was dedicated to building the science that would understand what stroke meant and how we could go about improving people's lives with it. And I noticed a um, question generated from the foundation that said, how do we use knowledge generated from cognitive neuroscience to improve the everyday lives of people with brain injury? That was the question that started the journey that I'm going to share with you today. Now, I had been involved in a number of interdisciplinary initiatives. I had served on the National Center for Medical Rehabilitation Research that wrote the plan for the start of the NCMRR. I'd also been a part of the Memory and Aging Program that was an interdisciplinary study in Alzheimer's disease. And I knew a lot of people around the university. And I thought, who could contribute to this initiative? Well, we would need cognitive neuroscientists. We'd need neuroradiologists, because they'd have to look at the images. We need physician scientists, because we had to have access to people. We needed psychologists and neuropsychologists, but we also needed occupational scientists, movement scientists, and communication scientists, because this is not an issue of one profession. If we're going to improve people's lives, it's very complex. So I had to think about what were the motivations to collaborate? And I think this is, these are questions we ought to be asking each other all the time. Well, when you collaborate, you actually further the science of the individual scientist. You have potential for funding. Nobody's going to work together unless there's a potential for funding because it's an environment where you have to have funding. There has to be opportunities for cross-disciplinary training. If we're going to train the next generation, we need to work together to do it. We need to generate knowledge for clinical trials. We have to understand the clinical condition. We really want to improve patient care. But the way this question was written, I knew we could improve the lives of people. And that's what I'm really motivated for, to improve the everyday lives of people. So we formed, initially 32 senior scientists came together. Eventually it dropped down to being about 12 of us that developed the Cognitive Rehabilitation Research Group that continues today, that involves this interdisciplinary team of clinicians and scientists to answer the questions which I will share. We also have been able to now have new international collaborators with a second McDonald's Science Initiative, which I will share at the end, and now we're doing policy work cross-culturally, cross-country with Australia, Singapore, and the U.S. to try to find out 
what are people with strokes needs, what are the services that are provided, and what are the policy implications of that, because we really can learn a lot by asking others. So we came together with a vision to improve the everyday lives for individuals with brain injury by translating neuroscience to support rehabilitation interventions. And in order to do that, we had to come up with a new definition of rehabilitation. Because if you're going to stretch from brain to function in everyday life, you have rehabilitation along this entire com continuum, but people doing imaging and people doing neuropsychological measures really are thinking more behavior and more brain function and not necessarily how people perform in their daily lives, and we needed daily life measures and function in everyday life. So that brought rehab to the table to design rehab, and I'll show you what we've done with that. How we did this, and it took several years, but Barnes Jewish Christian Health System is in St. Louis, and Barnes Jewish Hospital is actually our primary hospital. And we receive over 1,500 people with strokes into that hospital every year. So we built a data registry and a clinical core. So we have a patient registry, a lesion registry. We have behavioral data, performance data, and outcome data on people who have been admitted. And the reason we've done this is to do pilot rehab clinical trials. And actually, by this time, seven and about nine RO1s have come off this initiative. We wanted to do measurement development so that we knew how to ask the right questions and move the questions forward. The more basic scientists wanted to know the brain structure and function relationships. And the people working in the Alzheimer's Research Center we're really interested in the national, natural history of stroke because there continues to be questions about the vascular issues associated with dementia. So the first thing we had to do, and I think this is really important for you to understand in rehabilitation because we have silos also. When you're working across disciplines, everybody has a different language. And nobody really understands the language all the way through. It took us nearly two years to get to trust each other's definitions, to be able to identify the methodologies that would be used to study different things. You've got the molecular, cellular mechanisms of plasticity and receptors and neurotrophic factors and neurotransmitters and neuromodulators. Did they really care about education work, community life, recreation, religion, civic life, and child care? That's not what they were thinking about. But if we're going to improve the everyday lives of people, we have to build a language that allows us to work together. So we came up with everybody contributing their language to the table so that we understand what we all are looking at and how we can start to bridge measurements across these uh, different areas of science. So you've got the cellular levels, you've got the biomedical mechanisms, and some of you will recognize them here, motor inhibition and anatomical connectivity, pattern recognition, cellular activation, but then you get into body structure, body function, where rehab starts taking a major role, executive function, vision, audition, mood, motivational state, motor planning, language, attention, arousal. Then you get into functional limitations, which is gait, strength, posture, grasp, pinch, problem solving, range. And the activity is, they, can they climb stairs? Can they stand? Can they write? Can they dress? Can they walk? Can they listen? Can they learn? But learn to do what? Have the posture to do what? Well, to engage in education, to be able to go back to work, to engage in community life, recreation, religious and spirituality, taking care of civic life and child care. And then there's this environmental piece that some people sort of thought, well, well, that's something that social work does, but social work needs to be a part of this. 
what's social support, social capital, culture, assistive technology, and access to service. These are all things we're all collectively interested in, and it relates to how we're going to understand how the brain supports everyday life. I'm going to go over this quickly. Anybody who wants this presentation can ask, and Kieran will have it on disk and can share it with you. But we had to find out what people wanted to measure so that we could each get our questions answered. So there were things we had to have during acute hospitalization. We had to identify these cognitive constructs and how we were going to measure them, and we had to identify what we were going to do about daily life and how they were going to measure them. So... I'm about to start reporting some data to you that's come out of our journey. We have followed, as of last week, 17,589 people with strokes. More than 50% of them, actually 53% of them, have mild strokes that are so mild and people can do all their self-care activities, they're discharged from hospital with no rehabilitation services. And we'll talk about the consequences of that. 30, almost 31% have moderate strokes, which is a stroke of an NIH stroke scale of 6 to 16. This is where most people go to rehab because they have language or motor problems that are interfering with their daily life. They also have cognitive impairment. And then we have a 16% severe. Here's the thing that we learned that was flooring to us, just floored us. 6% of these 17,000 people are under the age of 40. 23% of them are the, between the age of 40 and 55. Now, this audience is full of people under 40 and people in the 40 to 45 range. Your daily life activities, the least of what you think about is whether you can dress or brush your teeth. You're running carpools. You have kids that are in sports activities. You're part of a community life. You have, you might be a young mother that has to diaper a baby. You have roles, responsibilities, and activities that have to be central to the rehabilitation process so that people can live lives. 22% of them are 23% are between the age of 56 to 64, 23% are 65 to 75, and 27% are over 75. If you total those up, 50% of the people having strokes in our sample are under the age of 65, and our current rehabilitation programs are very much designed for older people. They need to be able to go home and take care of themselves. What they really need to do, and I'm certainly in the over than 65 category, and I would find it extraordinarily difficult if I had a stroke, if I couldn't have my social life, have my entertaining friends, travel, international travel, my photography. Those are the things that give meaning to my life. And those are the things that people in rehabilitation have to find out about because those are the goals that the patients we're working with have goals to be able to do, not just care for themselves. Now, the discharge location is interesting. 36% of these 17,000 plus people are going home with no rehab whatsoever. None. They're seen in the hospital, they go. So those of you that are in acute care or thinking about working in acute care, it's absolutely critical for you to understand that you can identify people who might have some of the problems that mild stroke patients have to be able to start a system of services. Then 13% um, of them go home with some level of home health service. They're discharged extremely quickly. 37% go to rehab. Not 100%. Most people think if you have a stroke, you get rehab. Well, that's just not the way it is. And then 14% are going to skilled nursing facilities. And we've seen this increase a little bit. 
um, because skilled nursing is a little cheaper than rehab. And so we're seeing that become more of an option because, you know, we have a system of care that's very organized around maximizing the, minimizing the costs of care. But when I first started talking about this, people thought, well, you know, most of the people that are young are the ones having the mild strokes. That is absolutely not true. <laughs> you can see this, the age range on the mild strokes, the 75 to 65 to 75. We can look here, the blue colors. These are all people with mild strokes. They're all across age groups. And people do have lives to live, and we have to remember that. I just wanted to give you a hint at something. I'm not going to talk about it. I'm not an imager, but some of the data, we actually classified lesions on a grant from 2003 to 2008. 4,750 people with strokes images were classified by a radiologist, a neuroradiologist, using DiMazio's tapes. Only 445 of the 4,750 people with strokes had single lesions. And all the models for studying stroke are single lesion animal models. Dr. Alex Dromerick has written a paper about this. It was extraordinarily hard to get published because it's a reality that people don't want to deal with, because when you're in animal models, you want a simple model to be able to study. But many, 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 many people are really, they think they're first-time strokes, and they've really had a lot of TIAs before and haven't necessarily been recognized by themselves or their community physicians. So that's another problem that's that that's, we're watching closely with the TPAs, people who have these strokes need to get into facilities, into emergency rooms really quick. Okay, this is going to set the stage for what I'm going to talk to you about today. Right now, and I think we have to really credit Dr. Gresham and Dr. Granger and the colleagues that have worked really hard on the development of the functional independence measure because it became a policy instrument for much of rehabilitation. But actually, Dr. Granger and I had this conversation years ago, and I said to him, if you could just put the kitchen task assessment with the FIM, we would probably have a little bit more understanding of what the issues are of people with stroke. Here on the right, with the scores of 108 to 126, and I, there it is, this column are people who have six and sevens on the FIM. We let them go from rehab thinking they're going to be okay, right? They're discharged from the hospital. They're going to be okay. These are their community reintegration scores at six months. Even people that have the 6-7 FIM, a huge number of them, are having difficulty with community reintegration six months following stroke. So what is that? Why are they having trouble? So I took it one step further, and I had, I had a sample where I had um, executive function measures, which I'll talk about again in a minute, but with the FIM, and I found 150 or um, 155 people in my sample in our sample that had both of these. They I had their NIH stroke scale scores. I had their education and their age, and you can see that they have a fairly mild um, NIH stroke scale because we we find a lot of people with mild stroke, and then. Um, their age, 62.68. And um, here is, again, the FEM score. And there is, it's consistent through our, our data. There are about 35% of the people 
that do not have executive dysfunction problems, but about 65% that do, even with FEM scores that are perceived to be able to be functional. And people say, well, there are some cognitive things in the FEM, and that is, in fact, true. But here's the motor scores alone. So you see that there are executive dysfunction issues in people if you're just looking at motor FEM. So I'm going to talk with you today. I'm going to lay the groundwork with this data about the executive function performance test. The difference between neuropsychological tests and performance tests, they come from two different whole bodies of knowledge. Neuropsychological tests were used to classify the area of the brain that was impaired. This is long before there was imaging. And so they're very discrete tasks that may measure very discrete cognitive functions. Performance-based cognition comes from an ecological perspective that started with affordances and how the environment supports us in our cognitive performance, and the EFPT is one of those tests. It started for me when I developed the kitchen task assessment as a part of my dissertation, and it used to be that we just cooked oatmeal. But we added making a phone call, taking medication, and paying a bill because the literature is very clear that if someone's going to go home and be there by themselves, they need to be able to do these things. And what's interesting about this test is you can see the observed performance. Can they initiate the task? Do they stay organized with the task? Can they sequence the task? Do they use safety and judgment? Or can they complete the task? And actually, it's kind of interesting because it started out with people with Alzheimer's, and people with Alzheimer's have a horrible time initiating and completing, but you'll see through this data that people with mild strokes have a time with organization sequencing and safety and judgment, which makes it difficult for people to go back to work and hold their jobs, because those are such critical elements of being able to do tasks. And how it's scored is, e is pretty easy. They can do it totally by themselves. They need verbal guidance. They need a gestural guidance, a direct verbal instruction or physical assistance. And what I want us to think about as rehab professionals today, in rehab, we are full of these kind of cognitive cues. We use belts when we walk with somebody so they can be safe. We don't let them fall. We don't we give them gestures all the time. We're giving them verbal prompts. We're giving them um, instructions. And I think that's the reason why people are going home and not being able to do things, because we as rehab professionals are such extremely competent cures. So I want to show you this data. So in this sample, there are 109. The mean age is 60. The education is 13 years, so more than high school. Um, the NIH stroke scale score is still very mild, 3.31. Um, we got a good sample of males and females. I want to point out to you, though, and this is why we're doing this work with Singapore. There are two things in Singapore that are really interesting. One is if you go into Singapore with cocaine as a dealer, you are put to death. I don't know if you've been following the news that's happening in Indonesia right now. There are two Australians that took cocaine into Indonesia, and they're facing death. They're trying to keep them from being killed. They do not want drugs in their countries. So that's interesting because a lot of strokes cocaine-related. And the other is, whoops, we have a very large African-American sample here in our stroke population. And actually, the African-American sample in St. Louis is only about 14%, but 46% of the strokes are African-American. And in Singapore, they, have, they don't have an African-American population. And there are people that are really interested in this genetically and, and are trying to follow up on it. 
So this is the the um, uh, NIH region by lesion of the people in this sample. It's very interesting because people have strokes with no lesions. They show up with stroke symptoms, but there are no lesions. So that's that's one of the things that um, some of the newer um, methodologies with the resting state are trying to look at some of these things. Um, about three and the NIH stroke scale for the frontal lesions is about 3.5. The non-frontal is a little tiny higher, but not significant. There are deep hemisphere regions of stroke, and there are people with multiple lesions. So if we look at the FEM score by region of the lesion, it is not different across any of the lesion data in our sample of, of this 109, um, which means that there's not a lot of sensitivity of that measure with this particular population. Um, the neuropsychological assessments, there, people are falling within one standard deviation on those neurological assessments, and the only group that showed Trails A or trails B different was the non frontal group. And you would think it would be the frontal group, but it was the non frontal group. And the deep hemisphere and multiple lesions all scored fine on the neuropsychological tests. The, you all know the um, stroke impact scale? It's a traditionally outcome oriented. Um, clinical trial instrument where you ask the person what their um, percent of recovery has been. It's interesting because um, those with no lesion only think their recovery is at 70 percent, the frontals are at 60, the non-frontals at 75, the deep hemispheres are at 75, and the multiples are at 80. I, we have a tool called the activity card sort. And everybody's activity patterns are reduced as a result of these mild strokes. Those with depression, their people with no lesions are showing depressive scores. Frontals, deep hemisphere are showing depression, which is like really asking questions now about what is the relationship of depression and cognition following stroke. And then the EFPT, we see um, the most lesions in the deep hemisphere lesions more than in the frontal, which was our first clue that there might be some track or um, circuitry problems in information getting through from other regions into the frontal region because these are thought to be frontal tasks. So. Um, the kinds of problems people are having are sequencing and uh, safety and judgment. I'm going to go through this pretty quickly because I want to get to some other things. But if we divide this group that we had by no, no impairment in their executive function performance test and those with performance problems, the problems were mildly in organization, more in sequencing, but not initiation and completion. So if we divide them, you can see the trails A is not showing as strong on those who have executive dysfunction. The depression is higher in those with this executive dysfunction. Their activity participation is lower. Their perceived recovery is lower. Their community reintegration is lower. And so those who demonstrated these executive function problems versus those who didn't had difficulty with organization sequencing, safety, and judgment had given up more than 20 percent of their leisure, social, and instrumental activities and were more likely to experience depressed mood and were less integrated into their community. So the take-home message from this part of my presentation 
is it's critical that rehabilitation professionals identify and address the person's executive function problems in the early stage of stroke and not let them go home and fail in their marriage, have car accidents, and lose their jobs. And we have not done a really good job of this because we don't have measures to do it. Now, the MOCA, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but the MOCA can do a quick screen, and now that's a part of every patient in the hospital, and not just stroke patients because there are many other people that have executive dysfunction problems. But as hospitals become more concerned about people going home and have to be readmitted to the hospital, this whole concept of executive function is really becoming central to this because you need it to be able to manage medications and be safe. Just to let you know, this was a very small sample within our sample of, of patients that we, sub-participants we have. We've just finished another outcome study using the EFPT and as a part of the rehabilitation and training grant with Alan Heinemann, and we had 240, 204 people with chronic stroke and 58 controls in one year after stroke, and you can still see that organization sequence and safety was a serious problem in a community dwelling sample, which is something that I think we need to pay attention to. So what I want to spend some time on is talking to you about executive function and how each of us as rehab professionals can introduce and address these executive function problems as we go about our daily lives with patients in clinics. And there certainly are measures to capture them in research. But Executive function is the ability to integrate component cognitive abilities to produce meaningful task performance. So what if someone has an executive dysfunction, they have difficulty planning, organizing, and initiating new solutions. They can't identify and they have difficulty correcting errors. And they Without them, they can't suppress habitual responses. So you often see someone who's doing inappropriate things in a public situation, but they can't suppress them because they're not problem solving that they need to suppress them. And they also have trouble devising novel re responses. So what I want to say at this point is cognition does not belong to a discipline. Cognition is the process by which all of us become aware of objects of thought and perception, including all aspects of perceiving, thinking, remembering, moving, communicating, and doing. Oftentimes, there are people who want to set up professional boundaries. You take care of this, we'll take care of this. Cognition cannot be designated in that way because you can't do motor planning without cognitive capacity. Actually, I've, ch I've challenged my students for years to think about, and Brittany's here somewhere, you probably have had this question, what can a person do without, what you can do as a clinician if a person doesn't have cognitive function? The only thing we've ever been able to think about is do passive range of motion on an unconscious patient in an intensive care unit. Because it takes cognition to respond. It takes cognition to move. It takes cognition to speak. It takes cognition to problem solve and to do. So people with strokes have a challenge to their cognitive process and we need to plan our clinical and community programs to be sure that people with cognitive impairments can benefit from the services that will be offered. So everybody needs to know to recognize if someone's having an executive problem because the learning's not exactly going to stick. So I'm going to go on to the functional consequences of executive dysfunction. 
People with executive function also can cover socially, so you often cannot tell from their conversations that they have a problem. So you may be chatting away with someone who's really social and really capable, but you, unless you see them do something that's novel or requires their problem solving, you will not know that they have an executive dysfunction. And when we're dealing with overlearned activities of daily living, they're not really having too much problem with that. It's mostly a motor problem. But there is cognitive problem also. The other thing you need to know, people are capable of new cognitive learning. Basic attention and memory processes are typically spared. So they can store memories, they can store, store strategies, and they can learn new behaviors with practice. But we have to help them, and I'm going to talk to you about how to help them. And executive function is really needed, and I talked a minute ago about this, but correcting errors, suppressing irrelevant information, do anything that requires a sequence to successfully complete a task. Think about yourself if you go to Ikea and pick up a, even a child's toy that comes in a box. How you have to read the instruction to do the first thing before you do the second thing before you do the third thing. Well, you're sequencing. And that's something that someone with executive dysfunction has a really difficult time doing. And certainly it's necessary for living safely in a community and sustaining relationships. That's why a lot of people have executive dysfunctions, don't have the social skills and problem solving to sustain even former relationships that they've had before their stroke or anything else. So I want um, to, to tell you what you can observe. If we look at the literature, we know plan formulation, but you might have a patient that requires ongoing help and doesn't seem to understand what you're asking them to do. Be suspect. They have to be able to self-monitor and correct. You may have someone that you're working with that's not recognized errors and doesn't correct them the next time they face the same problem. They may have executive dysfunction. Inhibition of competing stimuli. They might, you might have a patient who's distra distracted by people or music or any noise. They may have an executive problem. Problem shifting tasks. They need cues or repeated instructions to move from one step to the next. That's where sometimes with the FEM, you give them a verbal prompt and they move ahead. But if you're constantly having to give in verbal prompts, you might suspect you're dealing with someone who has executive dysfunction. And then they have reduced self-control or impulsivity and they need to be reminded to stay focused on a task. Think about your clinicals. Think about being out with patients that you need, that are distracted or needs cues or need to be reminded. Those are things that you can say, we probably ought to have a conference and talk about this because this is the difference between they're ready to go home and they're not ready to go home because they're having these cognitive problems that need to be addressed. And if we don't get them started, we're going to have people that are not going to community integrate. And the reason I'm so passionate about this topic is the literature has been very clear in the last few years. Executive dysfunction is in head injury, stroke, stroke spinal cord injury. You know the person who doesn't do very well after spinal cord injury? Do you th when you really logically think about it, if you've had enough of a blow to break your vertebra, could you possibly had a concurrent head injury? We really need to be looking at these cognitive issues. Sports injury, all we have to do is hear, I mean, the last week, wasn't it, that one of the major league football players decided he wasn't going to risk his long-term cognitive strategy because he was having too many head exposure injuries playing the game? 
look at the why is the National Football League really interested? Why are so many boxers and football players getting early dementia? These are all because there were cognitive problems that needed to be managed. MS, a lot of MS has executive dysfunction, Alzheimer's disease, depression, schizophrenia, breast cancer. We now have a new project that it's called ChemoBrain for people that have cancer. COPD, cardiac conditions. Now, I was having an interesting conversation about a new study that showed that PT and cognitive behavioral strategies together improved um, uh, people's performance with car cardiovascular, um, comp dis where they're not, they're pretty compensated or decompensated. Um, well, how much of it is neurotropic factors? How much of it is just plain oxygenation? You know, so this is where we really need to work together with this. New studies, diabetes, does that make sense? Where well, there's a lot of glutamate problems in the brain relative to the function and diabetes. Autism spectrum, ADD, anorexia, chronic pain, drug abuse, alcohol abuse. Every single, practically every single population you're going to deal with as a rehab professional is at risk for these executive problems. So we can't just treat it as a physical problem. We have to think about it in the context there may be some cognitive issues going on here. So the pr basic principle everybody can use. You enable the patient to develop their own strat performance strategies versus telling them what to do. If you tell someone to do, what are you doing? You're cueing them. So how do you want to approach that, Mr. Jones? Give them the capacity to take the time to talk about what they might do and try it out and see if it fails to give them um, support. Also, enable the patient to use previously learned knowledge in a new way to solve a new problem. A lot of people, particularly in PT, you can look at what have people done in the past that have developed motor plans that they can, or motor memories that they can use to be able to form the basis of new movement patterns. Um, support their goals to foster their daily life. Those are active problem solving. So what I'm asking you to think about, and this comes out of all this work with stroke and the clinical trials we've been doing, we have to change from being a clinician who's an expert to a clinician that's an enabler because the majority of our patients need not just treatment, they need learning. We don't need to direct their actions. We need to enable actions for them to develop strategies. They don't need to see us as the expert. They need to see us as a partner that can help them get strategies. We, I, the word compliance and adherence kind of rubs raw with me because what we really are doing is needing to help people become educated patients with strategies of their own it's because it's the strategies that they can use in other tasks instead of just one. And we have to change the family as the observer, as the family as a team member. So if we look at this, we all can support strategies. If we give explicit instructions, I'm going to tell you what to do. Here, do what I say. Reach out here, grab this. Versus, I'm just going to let you figure it out on your own. Try it. Just do it. In the middle is the rehab professional. Try to figure it out on your own, but I'll help you if you get stuck. Giving people the opportunity to come up with ways they can do it that they can build into their repertoire for their own rehabilitation. Now, those are very basic principles. 
I would encourage every OT in the audience to go get co-op training, which is um, a cognitive behavioral strategy that can be employed even in acute care to help people start these strategies. And the reason I say that is we're in a changing medical system, and we're seeing a medical model that we all grew up on in where patients come to receive treatment to recover to being one uh, that's going to be more sociocultural, where people receive services to live their lives. And I happen to think OTPT and speech are three of the most important professions to make this transition, along with the physicians we work with. People have to be able to communicate, they have to be able to move, and they have to be able to do. Language pathologists are the most expert in communication. PTs have the most expertise in movement. And OTs have the most expertise in doing. Together, we have the capacity to move people in to live their lives. So if we talk about what supports participation in daily life, we know that all of us, including all the patients we serve, have to be able to do self-care, care of others, maintenance of their home. They have to do work activities, fitness activities, leisure and sports activities, community and social activities, and really important is religious and spiritual activities to very many people. So the person factors that support that is cognition, physiology, sensory, motor, psychological, and spiritual. We have a lot of knowledge about those factors and what we can do to help people. But in fact, we also need to be concerned about these environmental factors. Where is their social support? Where is their social capital? What is in the culture of the people we're working with? What can the physical environment and assistive technology provide in terms of tools? That's why rehabilitation is so complex, because we have to use different disciplines with different knowledge to come together with this body of knowledge to be able to help people live lives. It is not a one-discipline one show. This paradigm is changing. I talked to people today, institutional services, People who have strokes are in the hospital for 72 hours. They're in rehab for 14 days. Will they go back to living lives? They've just had a horrendous event that has turned their life upside down. So we can't expect our institutional services to do all the work. And out here is a huge community of support. Physical activity can come from fitness centers and exercise and peer support from families and church and learning from schools and whatever. But our rehabilitation program needs to have initiatives focused on participation, and they take all of us. We know that mass training improves function in animals. Can we get enough mass training to individuals to recover their brain injury, to move? Can we use virtual training strategies? Can we use assistive technology and robotics? Can people drive? How do we build communication strategies? Are they in safe homes? Can they learn strategies to support performance, family and patient training, and return to work, and relationships with independent living centers? We need to enable people to have the skills to go about their lives, and we have to support it with self-management. These are the kinds of programming that our health systems are looking for, and some of them know it and some of them don't know it yet, but these are the kinds of things that are going to prevent readmissions, produce a healthier person, and so that's why I think it's absolutely wonderful that you're in a school of public health because as we transition to build community programs to support people living lives, we can take a much more community-based public participation perspective on helping communities gain the strength to live lives because our healthcare system just keeps shutting down the, 
the hours into profits, and we have to redo this. Okay, I'm going to tell you really quickly about two things, and I may go over just a couple minutes. We didn't quite start at three. <laughs> um, we've started a new program, and we've done it through clinical trials, and it's so effective. And I was talking to um, uh, the, the gentleman from Community Health at lunch today and your dean from a public health perspective, and we took Kate Lorig's um, self-management, the Stanford self-management program, got her permission and put together a, a program called Improving Participation After Stroke Self-Management that actually helps people learn that they're not the only person with stroke and learn skills. And so instead of using just the basic chronic disease self-management of role management, emotional management, self-management, problem-based skills and self-efficacy, we added an approach for how do you support yourself regaining your roles at home and in community and work. And we were in there talking like professionals with them, and the first group said, wait a minute, can we put these in our words? We need to know what we can do for ourselves, not what you can do for us. And they identified, at, you remember at the personal level, I said cognitive, physiological, sensory, motor. I mean, that's the way we think. They think, well, I have mobility problems and weakness and poor coordination, and my vision's not so good, and I don't hear as well, and my taste and smell's off, and I'm not eating as well and I get really tired, and I have endurance problems. So they start talking about what their experience is with the stroke. And so they realize that then at the community level, they have really financial problems, and they, they haven't got an environment that's very accessible to them, and they don't have transformation, transportation very well. And here they are working together in a group, and they've found friends and networks, and they can, they're not the only person with stroke. And people are going back to work because they found out there are things they can do to help themselves. We don't have to do everything we do one-on-one. -on -one. We have to do it in the context of helping communities come together. So they came up with this. We can either change the person, which is rehab and remediation and exercise, change the activity, or change the environment. And our first data is coming out from this. Not Past the, 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 their self-efficacy scores. They believe and are exercising regularly, manage their disease better, they are managing their depression, and they're doing more chores as a result of this group self-management program instead of sitting alone watching TV at home. Okay. Remember early on I told you that we were linking brain to everyday life? Well, a whole lot of things have happened over the course of the last 15 years. And now we've got a model which is called ReLearn. And we've got interdisciplinary work at the pharmacological stimulation approaches, learning approaches, calibration, goal, <coughs> identification, and feedback and environmental context where we're actually trying to take a relearn perspective. And we just got a grant from the James S. McDonald Foundation after we did a planning grant to link 70 scientists around the world, neuroscientists, occupational scientists, movement scientists, communication scientists. And we're doing translation of neuroscience to rehabilitation in everyday life. And our goal is to use our collective science to create the optimal rehabilitation experience so each survivor can realize their full potential for getting better and living well after brain injury. And it's Europe, Israel, Asia, Australia, Canada, and the US. And we're all linked and have this money to communicate and fund pilot studies that'll take them into bigger studies. And we've already 
People have done a lot of work in the literature to come up with what is known, and we're trying to demonstrate that this there's a lot there already about this optimal rehab experience that needs to be put into evidence, is out there in evidence, but not necessarily translated to where people are just using it. And some of it's animal, some of it's cellular, some of it's human. But we are moving forward with the development of this interdisciplinary science because it's people who need this service. And as I want to sort of think about the future, re the rehab field is still in its first 100 years. It's really about 60, 70 years old. And Dr. Retake was one of the very first, in the first leaders of rehab medicine. And then you had the people that followed him, Dr. Gresham, Granger, Hamilton, and brought rehab science, rehab, into the mainstream of medicine. And it's really now our turn for our next generation of scientists and clinicians to contribute their knowledge and skill to help people achieve this optimal rehab experience. And what that means is that we can support meaningful lives and reduce costs because people who resume roles by engaging in family work and community activities are healthier and reduce burdens on families and society. And I really want to finish this by thanking Susan Nohyski because she literally told me I had to come and I did. <laughs> um, yesterday happened to be my birthday and I, I kind of was thinking that wasn't exactly what I wanted to do, but it's exactly what I wanted to do because it was nice to honor her and to honor Mrs. Retake and all of her continuing commitment to your program and to honor Dr. Gresham, and I thank you very much.